Welcome to the HU Movemakers Podcast, where we highlight folks that are blazing the trail and making moves in Howard culture. Hello and welcome to another special edition of the HU Movemaker Podcast. Today we got another, another special guest on the show. We talking about HU School of Law class of 1975, the original hustle co-author, bestseller of the Employment Law textbook. We got a bestseller in the building. Diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging. All of these are hot button topics in today's in, in, in today's world. But uh, our guest has been doing this. She's not new to this, she's true to this. Racial uplift, TED Talk, viewed by over 137,000. White House, Department of Justice, Federal Labor Relations Authority, Federal Trade Commission, first law clerk for the first black female appointed to a court. Man, I mean, we we got we got a history maker on the show today. We got Miss Miss Don D. Bennett Alexander. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Josh. I appreciate it. Oh, I appreciate no, no what problem. you're doing. I think this is really important for students to see. Absolutely. You know, we, we have to highlight all those people that have paved the way and that are continuing to do the work, you know, who care about Howard's legacy. So this is extremely important. I love that you're doing that. Yeah. So, so tell me, I mean, you came to the hustle, you know, class of 75. I'm oh, sure things so, have, 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 have changed since then, but, um, you know, and you know, you were you were doing diversity and inclusion. I mean, we've all we've always trying to be, we've always have been trying to be included, you know. Yeah. And uh we've been fighting white supremacy forever. But now with social media, the internet, everything is clickbait, you know, it's heightened sensitivity everywhere. Yeah. Um how do you feel for, for, for your work that you've been dedicated most of your life to and now it's, it's, it's become so popular? I mean, I have friends now that are like chief diversity officers of major corporations and these positions never even existed. Never you know? existed. And it never occurred to me that they would ever exist. And I have to tell you, um, you ask, you know, how do I feel about that work? Um, this past semester, the fall semester, was my final um, semester teaching at the University of Georgia after 33 years. And uh, I received a call from my president yesterday, the president of the university, Jerry Moorhead, who told me that a university committee had suggested to him, and he was accepting that suggestion, that the university create a perpetual award for faculty members who deal with diversity called the Dawn D. Bennett Alexander. Oh, wow. That's big time. Community. Oh, award. amazing. Amazing. And it's to Congratulations. A thousand dollars every um, year in perpetuity. Wow, that's amazing. So that is incredible. Wow. Uh, it makes it a pillar of the University of Georgia, which is huge. And when I look back on it, I came from DC. I grew up at 13th and East Capitol Street. And when I said I was going to Georgia to teach, I remember my sister said, Georgia, like, do they have paved streets there? <laughs> and um, that was the sort of place it was. But the reason I chose to go there was because the president then of the university, Charles Knapp, um, said he was newly appointed. He had come from D.C. And he looked around and he didn't see any black folk substantially. And he said, like, where are all the black people? And they had integrated in 1961. This was now 1987. And they said, we can't find any. And I came in January of 88. And he said, okay, well, I bet if I gave you money in your departments to find people, you'd be able to find people. And that's exactly 
what happened. But the reason I chose to come, despite the fact that it was Georgia, it was the 80s, it was not a good place to be, was because he said, we need to move forward. And that has been my journey ever since I came to help the University of Georgia move forward. And that was my vision to do it. And I thought about King saying, if not you, who? If not now, when? I mean, when? Um, and I thought about Howard and how we just didn't have a choice. Those of us who are blessed enough to be part of that group that does have the privilege must use it for racial uplift. Absolutely. So that has been my work for 33 years there. And to see not only that they put this in place, but then connected it with me because of the work that I've done there over the past 33 years is absolutely amazing. So to see that kind of progress, to see it go from, I was fighting a losing battle boy, but I was determined that I had a choice to make and I made it to do this. But I had to make a choice as an academic. You know, I was coming oh. over from practicing law to teaching law. And I had to, you know, your, your life as an academic is based on publications. And I was publishing in an area that was not familiar to people because nobody was really doing things about race at that point. And I was black and female advocating <laughs> racial positions looking at the cases that had come out and making determinations about whether I thought they were right or decided wrongly. And because people tend to think that if we are in a group, gender, race, we can't be objective about it. The only people who can be objective are white males. Um, you know, I knew they would look at my work and think it was suspect. Well, of course you would feel that way. You're black and female. And as it turned out, I said, you know what? I have to make a choice here. Do I do what I know is right and publish in these areas where I know we need to have this voice or do I worry about my career? And I thought about it and I said, you know what? I can always go back to practice in law. So I'm gonna do what's right and try to move this academic forum forward. And that's the choice I made. And it's never served me wrong. I ended up getting tenure in two different places based on my publications and ended up writing the best-selling employment law textbook in the country, which this month comes out in its 10th edition. Wow. Congratulations. And, yeah, and uh, we, I truly appreciate all of the groundbreaking work that you've done thank over you. the years, putting that work in before it was, you know, a popular thing yeah. to do. I mean, First, we got Georgia gets flipped. Now we got you as a uh, getting a, a, a award in your name in perpetuity. So your legacy is going to live on forever. I know that must be a good feeling. Um, so what, you know, you, you, you've done a lot, quite a bit of work. Um, what made you want to uh, get into this type of work? I mean, you, you come out of Howard, you know, I'm sure it's probably more financially beneficial to, to go another route it's not like it was a ton of black lawyers at that time i mean i don't yeah. know but you could have easily you know went in another direction what why go this route of diversity inclusion and yeah. racial uplift especially you know in 1975 you know that's a really interesting question and and it's it's really um layered uh i knew that my choice was going to be working in the public sector I got, uh, you know, I was an honor student. I was on law review. So when I came out of law school, I had a lot of offers, but it was real clear to me when I did my interviews that I was not going to feel um, really comfortable in the private sector. It just didn't fit me. And what I thought, especially coming from a place like Howard and before I had graduated from the University of DC, and for my first two years, I had been at Defiance College in Defiance, Ohio at the height of the Black Power Movement. So being in a cushy place where white folks dictated who I could be with, what I had to do with my time was not gonna mm. be okay with me. And when I eventually, um, when I was in law school, I had professors who said, you really should teach. And I was like, that will never happen. You will mm -hmm. never find me pontificating in front of a classroom. 
And I sort of ran from it for a long time, but I believe in uh, the universe sends you what you need. And they finally just plopped it down in my lap and there was sort of no way around it. Um, and when I looked at what, what the request was for me to teach, it wasn't anything I knew. I was practicing labor law at the time and the head of the agency I was in, the Federal um, Labor Relations Authority, had three members who headed it up and one of them was a black guy from New York. And one day I was walking down the hall and he said to me, can you come and see me in my office? I was working in the solicitor's office doing cases at the time, litigating cases at the in the federal courts and the Supreme Court. And it was like, okay, like did I do something to get fired? I couldn't imagine why the head of the agency wanted to see me. Mm -hmm. And what he said was, um, I've, I used to work for, I was assistant to the head of the Public Employee Relations Commission of New York. He retired to, to George, I mean, to Florida, and he's now looking to have a class in, I think they want to call it employment law, he said to me, are you interested in teaching? And I said, nope. And he said, are you interested in moving south? I said, nope. And then it sort of occurred to me, I was talking to the head of the agency so it was like what, and I'd said no twice and whatever he was gonna ask me had to be yes the next time. <laughs> and his next question was, well, can I send your uh, recommend, I mean, can I send your resume to them? And you know, it, it can go from there. So I said, yes. And as it turns out, they chose my resume. And when I went there to teach, I, went, I actually went back to the office when I got the offer and I said, y'all, they want me to teach something called employment law. And this is an office full of labor lawyers. And he said, I never heard of it. I have no idea what it is. And it's like, I don't even know what I'm, I'm supposed to teach. I had to figure that out. <laughs> and eventually it occurred to me, it was about Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And then I sort of got pissed off. It's like, seriously? Like I'm black and female and you want me to teach this course and like not discriminating? And then I thought about it and it was like, why not you? In fact, you'd probably been pissed off if it was somebody other than somebody black mm. or female. You would just, you know, it was like, what are you doing up there? And then the first year of it, this is how I got into consulting, which I've been doing from the beginning also, which really sort of made it blow up. Um, it occurred to me in about February or March that when school was out, I didn't have a salary. <laughs> so... I was like, what the heck am I supposed to do? You know, I was, I never thought about my salary. You could pay year round, right? As so even, even when you were um, a bestseller, you don't get residuals off of those books? Well, I didn't have the book then. I hadn't even oh, okay. taught the class then. Okay. And I ended up going to continuing ed. I didn't even know what it was. They said, well, maybe you can go to continuing ed because I asked my colleagues and they said, well, usually you just take money out of your check and save it for the summer. And I said, well, it's too late for that. I didn't know that existed or I had to. So they said, well, maybe continuing ed can do something for you. And continuing ed, as it turned out, offered classes to the community. And they, I said, y'all, I need some money for the summer. And mm -hmm. they said, well, you know, what do you do? And I told them and they said, well, you know, work up a brochure. And I'm like, a brochure, I teach. I mean, what, what do I know about a brochure? So I had to think about it a different way and I came up with a brochure. I had to think about what would somebody, what would make them want to take this class. And it became their top offering of all time. Wow. There were so many people that wanted to know about discrimination mm. because they, they just didn't know about Title VII. And I want you to think about the fact that this was at this point, 1983, and the Civil Rights Act had been passed in 1964. We are talking about nearly 20 years later and people still had no idea what it was. And because of it, people from the business community would come and take these seminars and it just went from there. Of course, they'd go back to work and they'd want me to come in and talk. So for as so, long as I've been teaching- So when I'm you say people didn't know what, what it was, is this- um. Do you think it was because people didn't want people to know what it was? Yeah, Josh, that's a good question. And I'm not sure quite how it happened. I think there just was no push for it. Um, people, if I took a guess, I would think 
you know, we have always had a civil rights movement in this country on some level, right? From, from slavery on, when people were trying to end slavery and then after that, trying to deal with this equity and equality situation. And it's only happened in really small pieces. And there are times when it's on simmer as opposed to it's on boil. So if you think about the 64 Civil Rights Act, that was a boiling point. And then things calmed down. Then there were the riots and things calmed down. And I think people just sort of hadn't really done the work of seeing what this law really meant. What does it really mean to say that you're not going to discriminate and you're going to treat people equally? And because there were no classes in it, it wasn't, there wasn't a real knowledge base about it. The reason it came up for the person who had retired to Florida and he wanted the class was because as the head of the Public Employee Relations Commission of New York, he kept seeing these claims come up and people would ignore them. And it turns out that they were claims about race discrimination and gender discrimination. And he just didn't think it was right, but nobody was dealing with it because they didn't know what they meant. They didn't know what to do with them. That's why he wanted the class. And that class ended up being something that gave it a stature, publishing papers, gave people something that they could read. And when the book came along, the first, I, I had tried to get publishers to publish the book because, you know, I was just sort of piecing my stuff together. And I'm like, what <laughs> I realize what this was? Yeah. I thought, you know, we need to have a book on this. People need to know what this is. They're dealing with this law every day and they don't understand what it is. And the publishers were like, I'm sorry, but why would we publish that book? There are no classes in this. And I'm like, but if you have a book, people will have the classes. Wow. Then the Hill Thomas hearings hit. That's uh, Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas. Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas. I remember that one. I remember Saturday. Supreme Court Everybody Justice. Everybody was glued to their TV sets because it involved sex. It involved race. And, and it's two black people. It was two black folk. And it was the Supreme Court. And a conservative Black man. Very, very. I mean, and he was taking the place of Thurgood Marshall, a Howard University graduate and the first appointee to the court. I mean, the Supreme Court, black appointee to the U.S. Supreme Court. Wow. And you had him doing the he was going to take that seat. Did he do oh it? My God. Did he do it? And why are we talking about cut hairs on Coke cans in a Supreme Court hearing? Right. Damn. This was what drew everybody to their TVs, but it was for the country really a baptism by fire because what happened was people saw the need. By Monday, I had on my desk competing offers from publishers saying, we want that book you were talking about, but please have a really good big chapter on sexual harassment. And that's really how the book was born. It is now wow. in its 10th edition and has been number one from the minute it came out. Welcome to the Go Fish Village podcast. As a Chinese proverb says, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. At Go Fish, our goal is to teach individuals just like you how to build wealth through real estate. How does that feel for your work to kind of be the gold standard, even going from, <laughs> from 1975 to the, I mean, not 1975, but from that moment, I mean, for 20 plus years now, it's number one. Yeah, that, you know, it's, it's really interesting when you say that, it's like, oh my God, if that was anybody, that would be phenomenal. But I'm in here. I'm not out there looking at it. So I just, you know, sort of don't even think about it. And it's interesting, that's a failing of mine. When I got ready to retire, I wanted to just slip out the door. And I had an old student that I had probably 20 years ago who said, you can't do that. I said, what do you mean I can't do that? Of course I can do that. And he said, you don't understand. You are thinking about this from your point of view, but that's not how we see you. We see you totally differently and he talked about the things you're talking about, you know, how much I had accomplished and how phenomenal that was. He said people would be 
pissed off that you did not let them say goodbye because you have meant so much to so many people. Mm. And that's the way the book is, that the, the book is a part of it. And I just sort of, you, you have to make me see that because I don't see that. In fact, today, as a matter of fact, Josh, it hit me, the conversation with my president hit me today. And I just boohooed. Because when he told me, it was like, oh, that is really, I mean, that's awesome. That's wonderful. And then I thought about it. It was like, wait a minute, what? This is huge. It is yeah. huge. My ancestors are rejoicing, all of them. When I say my ancestors, I'm talking about all of our ancestors because that's who I work for. You all mattered. You mattered for the hundreds of years that you were enslaved and nobody would recognize who you were as a human being. And mm. I have the responsibility of making sure they know who you were and who your progeny are and what we are capable of. I mean, I was at the March on Washington as a 12 year old. My dad was a minister in DC. I heard King give his speech, but it didn't mean anything as a 12 year old. Going to a place like Howard really made it mean something. And having, learning something as important as the law, especially as a female at the time when maybe the, there were 8% as opposed to the 49 or 50% law students that are female now, um, was a sort of baptism by fire, but it also was something that shaped and molded you. You didn't go to Howard and not know the legacy of people like Thurgood Marshall, who in doing the fights that he did for civil rights, you understood that you had something that you had to take and make bigger. So for me, being a, at, at Howard, if I had been probably anywhere else, it would not have been as meaningful as what it taught me to be there and just soak up what it meant for us to achieve as black folk and the responsibility we had to do it. You didn't do this to get a new car, to get a mm -hmm. bigger house. You did this because you needed to uplift your folk. To go from Howard to a place like UGA, I mean, you know, go dogs, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to go to that, that had to be, you know, you go from Chocolate City. Yeah. At the time. I mean, it may not be Chocolate City yeah. today, but yeah. when you was there, it was Chocolate City. It was Go Bison to, to now Go Dogs, you yeah. know. And now you're you're this um, law professor, you know, in the minority in that position. But not only at that, you're you're at a school where probably, you know, less than 1% of the population is, is, is looking like you. I mean, what was that like? To well, it's a bit more. Okay. 6%. I say we're up to 6%. The truth is it was about 6% when I came. I mean, it was about 6% when I left. Maybe it crept up to eight. <laughs> but I was the only black tenured faculty member in my college. I taught what is that like? in what the is college that like? business. Walk me through that, a day in a life when you're trying to like establish respect. You're trying to let them know, hey, I'm just as smart as you. And I'm not just teaching something that's just uh, elective. Like this is stuff that this is needed stuff that's going to make you guys get to that next level of life. Yeah. I never had to worry um, with the students. I, I say I never had to worry. I think a lot of it is the way you carry yourself. Just today, I got a, a direct message from a student who heard I was retiring. And she said, you being in the classroom, she was a black student. And she said, what you taught me, although you probably didn't directly mean to do this, was to take up more space in the world and be confident in who I am. And I think I've had many students say over the years, all sorts of students, and of course, it's a predominantly white school, that the way I was, was so natural in a classroom that there was never a challenge. It, it just wasn't even a question that we were going to learn the law, but we were going to learn a whole lot of other stuff that really mattered and that you would take with you in the process. So yesterday, I get an email from a student who said, I would give anything to be, it's been 15 years, but I have thought about you so much over the last four during Trump, and this was a white student, because being there in class with you and discussing those issues is something I know would make me feel better. I just, I envy the students who can do that 
because of what it, how meaningful it was. Now that was 15 years ago. So knowing that I could impact students like that and have what I got from Howard be transferred to them gave me a sort of, um, and I want students to, to really own this, it gave me a sort of confidence that never made it so I was not standing in my truth. And when you stand in your truth, and I understand that I'm standing on my ancestors and all those who came before me, I'm sorry, but you just, you're gonna look a certain way that's gonna make people say, okay, I'm not messing with her. In fact, I should probably say this. <laughs> One of my colleagues at some point, and you ask how it was to be the only tenured black faculty member in the college, he said, you know what your, your um, nickname is, don't you? And I said, no, I didn't know I had one. And he said, it's don't fuck with Dawn. <laughs> I said, I wasn't prepared for that. I said, but you know what? I said, let me tell you this. And this is a word I rarely use, racism. I said, it's racist and it's sexist. But if it means you won't do it, then fine. I'll wear that name. Wow. Own it. Powerful. So they didn't bother me. And, you know, at the end, who's left standing? Who's got a university wide recognition for what they did in that classroom? That's huge. That's and to think yeah. about all of the, all of the people, the lives that you touched in the classroom and you help them shape uh, their careers further along. I mean, that's yeah. powerful because not yeah. just the fact that you were edu able to educate, um, you know, people that look like me and you, but a lot, a lot of those non-black kids, you, you probably were their first black teacher that they ever had. Oh, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would say to them, look at what you're missing. How much progress has, has been made since, 1975 yeah, when you yeah. or whenever thing. you first started doing this work um yeah because I, I read statistics and they say you know hey black people still own the same amount of net worth is still the same you might yeah. have more money but percentage wise it's still the same or you know education we might you know it's basically saying people are being educated more but nothing is really changing i mean yeah. in your view it, it's How not that changed? nothing's changed. A lot has changed, but think about where we were. I mean, this country from the beginning of its founding, I mean, 1619 was just um, the 400th anniversary of slavery was just um, commemorated in 2019. Well, for 402 years, we've been here. Uh, some say we got here even before. And think about all the way through the founding of the country, up through to 1964, because Jim Crow was that 100 years after the Civil War. Until that Civil Rights Act was passed, essentially not much had changed, okay? It was still legal to discriminate and all of that kind of stuff. Thinking about where we were since 1964, and I say the law was passed in 1964 because it was, but you know you weren't going to be the first one sitting on the front of that bus. It was going to take a minute to <laughs> yeah. get used to that idea, right? Right. So I say 64, but you know we can go all the way up to the 70s. For instance, where I am in Athens, Georgia, the public schools were not desegregated, and this is from the 54 decision until 1971. Okay, so people were dragging their feet, but you understand why if you understand that they didn't know anything else. To us, it makes no sense. We say just treat people like they're human beings. But for other people who have never had that thought in their head because they were taught something different, that doesn't make sense and it's going to take them a while to adjust. So while there have been an incredible amount of changes made, because the system that we operate within was built out of that 1619 kind of mentality. That's where systemic racism lives and breathes and still is in place today. And the attitudes are the things that to some extent are changing. Most of my work in diversity, inclusion and belonging is in a very specific niche. I deal with people changing their attitudes because your attitude and what's in your head is what drives your behavior. But you are not aware of most of it. 
And as an example, I talk in my TED talk about when we moved from DC to Florida, when my daughter had just turned four years old, she had never seen a white doctor. So when we went to find a new pediatrician and he came in, he turned around and left right back out. So she said to me, who is that? And I said, that's the doctor. And she said, no, I mean, the person that just went out. I said, honey, there was only one person that went out. It was the doctor. She said, but mama, he can't be the doctor. And I said, honey, why not? And she said, because he's white. Hmm. And it occurred to me, she'd never seen a black doctor. So without us ever having a conversation about it, by four years old, she had picked up that you couldn't be a doctor and be white. You had to be black. Yeah, that reminds me of that, you know, that paper bag test or that uh, not paper bag, but the um, that test they did a while ago. It, it 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 made news headlines when it was like pick out the the good dial, and pick out the bad dial. Like, and a lot of black kids were saying that the bad dial was the one that was yes, that was the black dial because that's all they seen on TV. Black people always that, being portrayed those, as those, Think about it. Yeah. Think about how young those kids were. Those were preschool kids. Yeah, they had already picked pick that up. That's why that's where I work. I work to get people, I just did a session today for UGA staffers, to get them to see what's in their head so that they can operate differently. If you do the opposite, if you keep on putting in place these policies and say, you know, we need more diversity, so let's have a different kind of hiring scheme, let's have this many people in, that's still not going to keep those people once you get them because they're still not going to feel like they belong there. The reason they don't feel like they belong there, that they're valued, that they're heard, that they're a part of the team is because of actions that people do every day that they're not even aware of. So how do you, how do you get people to recognize their own biases? And and I don't deal with them as biases. I don't even use that word. I don't talk about unconscious biases. Because that language is language that can put walls up. People Mm -hmm. bring their baggage to that language. What I get them to do is talk about their messages. So I ask them, what messages? And we talk about where do messages come from? What messages do you receive? Did you receive growing up about something like, you know, and something really innocuous? And when I say innocuous, I mean in the sense that nobody's going to say anything bad about it. So disabled people. And of course, everybody knows what you learned growing up. Don't look at them, you know, don't tease them. But we know on the playground, it's a different story. So you're actually getting mixed messages. So we talk about this and we talk about how you get it. And because we're talking about the messages you receive, you don't have to own this. You didn't put that billboard up. You didn't say to somebody this, this is what you got. And because we're talking about from the beginning, what you receive, not how you think. What did you receive? What sort of stuff did people tell you? They understand they don't have to own it. And I don't want them to own it. I just want them to know that it went in and it found a home somewhere until they recognize that it's there. And because they operate on the basis of it, just like that guy who thought it was perfectly fine to tell that my MBA student, we're not even talking an undergrad, Mm -hmm. somebody with an advanced degree, that you would have paid them 50% more if they were a male. You're not going to say that unless that's what's in your head. So I have to get with what's in your head and make you see it without telling you, you told me what your messages were. Now you do the work of figuring out whether you need to work on those. What that does is it gives people space And I believe they need grace, too, because this is real new territory for all of us. Okay, we just have not been here before. I turned 70 on January 2nd this year, and today is, what, the 13th? I know how long we've been at this stuff. I was there for all the big movements. We have never been here before, where we are openly talking about things like race in a workplace. So people need tools to be able to do that. Because talking about it around your kitchen table at Thanksgiving time is not the same as bringing it into a workplace and listening to those stories that people tell you about what their experience is, what yours as a Black male is, that they will never understand, but they can certainly empathize with. When you say, I have to worry every time I get in my car and it's dark outside, 
that I won't get stopped by the police and be pulled over and killed for something like a missing light. Mm. They don't know that. It's not in their world. It's not one of the messages that they grew up with. But bringing it to them in a way that doesn't accuse them or make them feel guilty, because again, their message is coming to you, ends up giving them space to be able to make the changes on their own. And what I want is I don't want you to be with me for an hour or three hours and feel good about it. I want you to go out and do the work. I want you to do just what my students write me about 15 years later. Have you heard this notion that um, it seems like white women benefit from like these black revolutions, whether it be like affirmative action, you that, know, that's not or that's a thought. That's a fact. Or me too. Or that's <laughs> a fact. Know, I mean, that's how does that? How does that happen? That you know, well, somebody can because, hijack a movement. You yeah, know I mean? and I don't think it's intentional. I think again, you have to deal with what's in people's heads, right? You have to deal with what's in people's heads. White women didn't march and say, "Put us in front of the black women." They, I mean, they were probably not even aware that it was happening, but think about how that happens. And, and as a lawyer, if I don't want you to get into trouble, and I'm looking at cases about how you get into trouble, then what I have to do with my students is let's deconstruct this and say, how could this have been avoided? So that thought process of deconstructing is very instructive because it you have to deal with how decisions are made. So if I am mo most used to seeing white women in a workplace because black women came in later. We did not all come in together in the same numbers. Then number one, they're going to be probably have more longevity for this promotion or whatever is going on. And secondly, it's who I feel most comfortable with. That's why doing the work of what's in your head to tell you that's who you feel most comfortable with. You see that for yourself and you see that's why you chose that person over that person it ends up being so beneficial, okay? When you leave people to their own devices and leave that part out, this is what you get. You're not looking at me the same way that you're looking at this white woman standing next to me because I don't fit into your world. You didn't grow up with me. You didn't go to the same schools as me. I don't look like you, I'm an outsider. And what one of the things I had, a they did a six page spread on me uh, in the, a few weeks ago in my college's magazine because I was retiring and they talked about practical diversity and which is what I do. And they said, you know, what's the best thing they can do in order to, you know, do what they need to do better. And I said, do it. Period. End of sentence. Because if you don't, if you don't do the work, of, because we had talked about doing the work of thinking about this, you're going to keep making the same decisions. It's not going to occur to you that you're, you, continue, you continually hire yourself. So, Josh, if all the heads of the businesses, except for three of the five CEOs in the Fortune 500, are white, and they keep hiring themselves... What's your chance of getting hired? Slim to none. Yeah, which is why it's longer. It, 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 it takes more thought than saying, you know, let's have this policy that three people sit on this committee whenever we get ready to hire somebody. That's going to have an impact, but not the impact you want it to have. You may get more people in there. And they've said, you know, affirmative action, diversity is asking somebody to the dance inclusion is asking them to the dance once or to dance once they're there mm. okay even if you get those people in they're not going to stay if they don't feel welcome and one of the things is they know you just got them so that you could fill a spot and i've had people actually say that well you know we needed somebody black or we needed somebody female so it, it makes perfect sense to me that it, the first person that, that's going to get the benefit of that is going to be white folk. And when you look at the statistics, they are incredibly consistent. Wow. Not because the white women want them to be, but it's the people who are hired, what's in their head about who they should hire. Who's, whose job is it to, um, to educate 
I guess, or uneducated white people on that black is, folks because I, 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 I heard it like I was on this app called Clubhouse, and um, it was a guy, a white guy who was, uh, I guess they say, trying to be an ally to black people. Like, how can I help? You know, I come in, you know. I don't see color like I see people as this. And then there was another guy. He was like, a, he was like, a, he was like more on the militant side of it. He was like, it's not my responsibility to educate you. You need to go do your own research. So the fact that you saying, you know, what can you do tells me that you haven't even done any, you're not even educated to even be on this panel. And I never even looked at it from that way. What are your thoughts on that? I have very definite thoughts about that. This is what I call the divine burden. Okay, and it's a burden I've been carrying all my life to do the teaching. And I understand that's what I was called to do. I think it is, and I, and I know there are people who say, it's not my, my job to teach you. The truth is, if you thought about what I said to you, the truth is, it really is. It's all of our jobs. It's every single person's job to teach what they know. That does not mean that everybody doesn't, who doesn't know or who may know less doesn't have a responsibility. But remember how I talked about the thought being the parent to the act. When you act certain ways, I can use that as what I love, which is a teachable moment, okay? And that teachable moment will usually stick with you. So when you say whose responsibility is it, does it make sense? And, and that, again, practical diversity. I'm a Capricorn. We are practical. When you look at my yearbook for Howard, it says Dawn Bennett at Capricorn. <laughs> okay. Talk about back in the day. You actually gave your sign in the yearbook. Okay. <laughs> but one of the hallmarks of Capricorns is that we are practical people. I hear the theory, but what does? how does it work out? What's real here? And what's real is for that person when you meet up with somebody and they're trying to do the right thing, they're not going to necessarily know what that right thing to do is. Because think about the difference. Josh, you and I aren't the same. Why would we be? We're mm -hmm. male, female. We probably, we're certainly an age difference. We probably grew up in different circumstances. So what we bring to any encounter we have is going to be different. And it's going to vary from person to person. So there's no one size rule about how you deal with black folk. Yes, you need to inform yourself. And I have a whole website, practicaldiversity.com, where you can go and find anything you want on what you need to do. Don't tell me. And it came from students. My old students called me up after nine or uh, uh, five, uh, May 25th, saying, oh my God, I wish I was back in class. Do you have anything for me to take a look at? I put together a website that I'm constantly updating. If you don't, you don't have any reason to say, I don't know what to do, go there and find out. Read all kinds of stuff. And then use it, engage in the conversations. One of the people at the session I did today said one of the reasons why he felt like it was uncomfortable for white folks to have conversations was because they feel like they didn't know anything about race. And it's like, there's not a person in this country that doesn't know anything about race. None. We live in a racial society. Absolutely. You grew up, even if you never mentioned it, just like the guy who said, I lived in a town where they didn't allow blacks. That's a racial history. Oh, Think yeah. about what your racial history is. Think about the messages you receive and how you're using them. Mm -hmm. Look at stuff. I learn new stuff, go online, go on the internet every day, finding out new stuff that I didn't know. And I literally have been writing a book for 10 editions on this stuff where I include things that actually happen aside from the cases to put people in the context of it. So you don't just think this is just, not everyday life, it is. So I think all of us have a responsibility. And I think black folks really need to understand space and grace is such an important part of this process. We cannot do this alone. We are asking people to be equitable. We are demanding that they be equitable. And then to say, but I'm not gonna tell you what that looks like for me or how you need to do that for me, or you need to go off on your own and do it. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And let me show you just how quickly these teachable moments come up because they pop up all the time. My daughter, who is an athlete, uh, 
went to UGA's summer basketball camp, women's basketball camp, from the time she was eight years old until she maxed out. And she happened to be in town one day when they were having a women's basketball game. So we went to the game. We parked in a new lot and I didn't, it wasn't a lot, it was a building, a parking uh, deck. So I didn't even know where I was. I'd never been there before. So we see some people going toward the elevator. So we just say, you know, we'll follow them. They're probably going to the game too. So we do, and as we're approaching the elevator, they get on and they watch as the doors close. Now we are right behind them. And they were all white folk. And we were like, what the hell? <laughs> I mean, nobody tried to catch the elevator. So we pushed the button. It was like, whatever. We push the button. We wait for it to come back. It takes a long time. And when it comes back, the door is open and there stand those same people. <laughs> this was the Lord's work, okay? They are standing there and they look like deer in the headlights. You knew every single one of them knew they had done wrong. They knew it. I didn't have to say a word. So I had to very quickly think about what I wanted to do. Do I cuss them out? Do I roll my eyes? Do I give them a side eye? Do I talk loud to my daughter so they can hear me? What do I do? But I'm a teacher. Teaching is what I do. It's who I am. I do it 24-7. This was a teachable moment. And I have to think in order to have those, you got to think about what your goal is. My goal is to not have you do that anymore. If I start cussing at you, see, that's how the niggas are. Okay, that's what you, we know that's the thought in their head. So that's not what I wanted. What I wanted was the, to never do that again, to know what they did and to never do it again. So I got on the elevator and as I was getting on, I said, mm -hmm, you tried to leave us, but it didn't work that time, did it? Well, everybody broke out laughing because it not only relieved the tension, <laughs> but they knew I knew what they had done. Yeah. And it, I knew they would think twice before they ever did that again. Welcome to the Go Fish Village podcast. As a Chinese proverb says, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. At Go Fish, our goal is to teach individuals just like you how to build wealth through real estate. You are old school, class of 75, Howard University, school of law. <clears throat> so now I'm... Um, so here's, here's a question. Now, of course, we want to be inclusive to everything and open to these different ideas. One thing that, and I'm, I'm, I consider myself to be progressive, but sometimes I'll be asking myself, are people like doing too much? You know, for example, there's now a thing where people, if you're born a man, you don't, you, you don't consider yourself a man. Or, or you don't even want to be called a woman. <laughs> you, you don't want to have an identity. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what is going on here? You know, um, even, you know, I sell insurance and even on our applications now, it's male, female, and then there's this other category. And, you know, I'm trying, you know, of course, professionally, you know, hey, whatever you put is cool with me. But a part of me is like, logically, that just doesn't compute to me. You know, is it and no disrespect? Like if I wake up and say, hey, I'm a chicken, you know, like I can't say that. You know what I mean? But you you have to respect how everybody feels. And then even, you know, there's a popular basketball player, uh, Dwayne Wade, uh, you know, his son. um, it was like 10 or 12 and decided that he wanted to be a, a woman, you know, at that point. And I'm like, okay, is you, you definitely want to support your kids and their decisions, but at, at what age do you let a 10 year old or whatever make that decision? Cause you know, my daughter, if it's up to her, she, she want to, you know, eat candy 24 seven, you know? Um, I don't know. I mean, as somebody who's in that space, you know, and I'm sure you consult with businesses as well. You know, they want to be sensitive to these things because they're not trying to be sued. But at the same time, it's like, you know, if you can weigh in on, on some of that. Josh, you, I could just kiss your face. This is such a great question because it gets at so much of what we've talked about. If you start in the right place, you end up in the right place. If you don't, you don't end up in the right place. 
if you think about it, most people will say, you know, I treat everybody the same. I mean, people are just people to me. No, they're not. When somebody's pregnant, you ask, is it a girl or a boy? Yeah. When they're born, you say, it is, a, is it a girl or a boy? <laughs> right. Why? What difference does it make? It's a baby. Mm-hmm. You're not going to do anything to it. You're either going to buy some clothes and why should they look different? Or you're going to buy a toy. And what difference does that make to a baby? We treat people differently based on all kinds of characteristics. And it starts with gender. So the question becomes, what difference does it make what that person decides to come out as? And I say come out because the truth is, you said, at what point do you let them make the decision? It's not a decision. The decision is whether I want to go with this, but the feeling is there the whole time. Whether you're two or 12 or 20, this is how you feel. Now, people are treating you a different way because they're treating you consistent with what your gender looks like. But in your head, you know that's not what you feel like. Now, if you at a younger age are astute enough to say, this is not how I feel. I feel like I want to put that skirt on. That's a feeling. I could probably not make you put that skirt on if that's not what you were feeling. A little boy is like, you must be crazy. I don't want that skirt. Okay, a little boy who is cis boy, same gender, and he's comfortable with it. But somebody who's trans doesn't feel that. So it's not when they decide they want to be something else. It's when they decide to tell you who they truly are. That takes a lot of trust. And that's why I love it when parents allow them to do that when they're young, because for them to tell you that is huge. And let me tell you the opposite. The only out transgender person we have on our campus is a person who was actually in my college. I knew him, oddly enough, because our kids were in school together and I was head of the PTA. And he comes to my office one day and he said, I'm transitioning. I said, oh, to what? I had no clue. And he said, to female. And I was like, oh. And I burst into tears. And we sat there and and cried together. He was 50 years old and my tears were because of what the pain must have been for him to live for 50 years as something he wasn't. Mm -hmm. That took a lot. I was glad he finally decided to own what he was. And what did that do for me? It didn't change my world. Like, why do I care? Why would I even have have a a comment? So now when someone says I'm trans I I understand that you know but when someone says I'm not when they're born let's say with a vagina and then they and then they say hey I'm a I'm a I'm a man it's like I don't feel like you can say that because you haven't gone through you know it's like somebody bleaching their skin and says hey I'm white I under I know what it's like to be white you know I, I could see somebody saying, hey, I'm trans white or whatever you want to call it. Like, I get that because it, it kind of says, OK. And I know sometimes people don't like labels, but it kind of tells me what you've been through. Like, you know, OK, but when you just say, um, yeah, I'm a man now. And I'm like, OK, well, it's some things I, like I went through puberty. Like you didn't. It's, it's, it's a little bit different. But- Why do you care whether they went through puberty? Well, I mean, literally, I, I don't I don't care. I, I don't care. It's it's just like, you know, if I go to my wife and say, I know what it's like to be a woman. That's a lie. I don't know. Just because I had a sex change. I don't know what it, what well, it was like. But, for but remember, the sex change is the end part. Mm-hmm. That part that has been there all the time is what made you feel like you were female. By the time you get to the to the outside, I mean, all the inside has been operating the whole time. What is hard, and and one of my favorite, one of my best all-time sessions, 
every spring I do a session with bankers. Okay. You can't get more conservative than bankers. Right. And when the transgender decision came out of EEOC, I deal with them through um, fact patterns. So I put this in a fact pattern. So we're dealing in Georgia with conservative bankers. Okay. I knew when everybody got, because I have them read the fact pattern first and tell me when they're done and then we can talk about it. I always know when they get down to the part about the transgender because <laughs> everybody starts to snigger. And of course they have very definite opinions about it. So we start talking about it and they go from A to Z. It is amazing what happens in 90 minutes. And it's not because I make them change their mind. I can't do that. It's because we talk about it in a way that gives them information they did not have before. So in this particular session, <clears throat> this woman sitting on the front row says to me, I believe in Jesus Christ and I'm a Christian and I will never believe that this is okay. And I said, that's fine. You mm -hmm. don't have to believe it's okay. What we're talking about is how does the law say you have to deal with these people, okay, that you put in this category. That's all we're talking about. We're not talking about changing your opinion. You can feel however you want to. Oh, ah, okay. So okay, okay. she said, well, I'm not going to change my mind. And I said, I, I don't know if you heard what I just said, but you don't have to change your mind. Just You just don't. It's not fair for you to get your bank in trouble because of the ideas that you hold that you then act on that you don't have to pay for, your bank has to pay for. That's what I'm trying to deal with you on. Mm -hmm. Well, we have this whole discussion. At the end, there are all these people lined up to talk to me and she keeps getting, letting everybody go in front of her. So finally it gets to be that she's the only one standing. And she said, I don't know how to tell you this. And I said, what is it? And she said, I know what I said at the beginning but the truth is, now that I know this, you should be come, You should come and talk to every little bank in the whole state because we all feel this way. But what you said was right. And this is the way we ought to think about this. I said, what? I thought you told me you were never going to change your mind and all of this. She said, I just haven't thought about it. And everybody around me feels the same way and thinks the same way. So we think it's right. So then by the time I get out to my get to my driveway my phone rings somebody calls me from that group and said i don't know if you can hear this but we went to dinner right after that session and you are the topic of conversation because people could not believe the difference between how they felt about that issue before you we talked about it and how they feel about it now she said i've never seen anything like it it's like miraculous hmm. thinking about it in those terms that I told you about the messages, takes you to a whole different place. And it was even different for me, Josh, before I actually walked through that process with someone, because when he, the person in my, or my faculty, when he went to our Office of Institutional Diversity and said, this is happening with me, so I wanna know like, you know, what the university's policies are and all that kind of stuff and what I need to do, they said, actually, you know, you need to go see Dawn, who is in your college, because this is the sort of stuff she deals with all the time. And he just hadn't even thought about it. We ended up sort of going through this process together. So I got a lot of insight that I would not have had just looking at cases. Mm -hmm. And it put me, it just gave me information I did not have before. I mean, when we say things like, how can that happen? Or how could they do that? How could they decide to do that? It's not a decision. It's what they were feeling all this time. But we dealt with them saying we treat everybody the same. Turns out we don't. We dealt with them as if what they looked like was real. And why wouldn't we? We didn't have any reason to suspect it. But the whole time they had this internal battle going on. And one of the things that comes up as legal issues in the workplace is that people would play out the stuff that you're saying, not that you would do it, but people would play that out. So they would say things like, oh, I guess I have to call you her now, or she, or he, she, and stuff like that. Very demeaning kinds of things. And 
It's like, what would it cost you to say him instead of her? What would it cost you? I mean, I know you got this thing going on in your head, but what comes out your mouth is a different story. Nobody told you to take that person to lunch. Nobody told you to take them home to mama. You just come to work and deal with them. And that's not changed. In fact, the Supreme Court just recognized that, hallelujah, in the last term, right? When they said you have, which I had argued for years, you have to treat this as a type of gender discrimination because there's no way that you can have a rule that says you can't discriminate on the basis of gender and not put gender into that conversation that you're having about this person being trans mm. or LGB, okay? Lesbian, gay, or bi. That's gonna be based in some part on gender, your expectations of what somebody should act like versus what you think they're acting like and how they don't meet up to your standards. Man, that's a great answer. I got a few more questions to not let you love. So I want to I want to talk about a little bit about Donald Trump. I really want to ask you this. Does Black Lives Matter without COVID being in place? Um, textbooks that we things that we've been learning all our life like what responsibility do these tech textbooks have to undo oh my God. all a this lot. a learning. lot and you know donald trump gets elected president okay but then he gets 70 million votes <laughs> again i mean i want to talk about your ted talk um so and then i want to leave with this question uh the debate of segregation being good for the black community. Um, you know, you can make statistics say anything, right? <laughs> Basically, you can find a number that says, well, at this point in time, black people were making more money. Uh, the man was work, black men, more black men were working. The divorce rate was lower and whatever, whatever. And then once segregation happened, we lost our tradition or we lost whatever. You know, you look at Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the dollar stayed in the community for 10, 11 times before it left. Now segregation happens and I'm a doctor, a lawyer. I'm leaving the hood. You know, I'm leaving. I'm going to be in this white community. So mm -hmm. it's, was segregation good or bad for the black community? Yes, to all of the above. Okay. I mean, it is not an argument. It had its good parts good parts that came out of bad parts. We were forced to be together, that was bad, but it also meant that everything was very insular. So your black teacher valued you. I just read a statistic the other day that said that black babies born from black doctors have a 20, something like a 29% higher survival rate. Wow. Okay. I once had my OBGYN who was black pull a textbook down off a shelf and show me where it said, that's why textbooks are so important. If your patient has tumors and she is black, just give her a hysterectomy. If she's white, cut out the tumors and try to save. These are doctors. I just did a, a keynote for a group of doctors recently, and they were shocked at the statistics that showed how discriminatory they were, because they got to say that nobody escapes what I just told you about messages. So even for something as objective as we think the body is and a doctor, the statistics showed that even when this is now, doctors are tested as to whether they hold myths about black bodies, they still do. These are not old doctors. Oh yeah. These are residents. Yeah, they so will they say stuff like we, we, we have, could endure pain longer. We can endure pain longer. So almost a million kids diagnosed, not we wonder if, diagnosed with acute appendicitis. Black kids were much less likely to get pain medication than white kids, okay? Those are things we think are objective and those messages have crept in all their lives and they end up believing them without even knowing. These doctors were shocked when they told them what the statistics were. 
yet I get a letter a couple of weeks later and I'm, I know, you know, y'all ain't gonna wanna hear what I'm telling you, but I have a responsibility to tell you because how are you gonna fix it if I don't? I get a letter a few weeks later saying, your session was the highest rated session of all the ones that were given. Wow. And I read them the riot act, but they knew they needed to hear it. And I gave them tools to be able to deal with it. So we can't hide. This is a messy business. There are no cut and dries. Did we have, was segregation bad? Yes, it was. Was it good? Yes, it was. When we went to teachers who, who valued us, those teachers treated us differently than when we went to white schools and they totally dismissed us mm. as being these no nothings who probably, I remember reading about this one girl who kept getting A's, she had always gotten A's. Then she, her schools were integrated. She had white teachers. She couldn't get an A to save her soul. In fact, she got D's and F's. So finally one day she gave her paper to her white friend mm. to turn in, it got an A. Her paper from her white friend got a, a, a much lower grade because it was her. So, I mean, there's no question, but you know, why fight that stuff? That doesn't mean that we should all still be segregated by law, but there were some values. We now have a choice about where we want to spend our money. Be it not being segregated doesn't mean you can't spend money in the black community. Mm. Let me say this about textbooks. One of the reasons that I usually say to people that I have, that I co-authored the leading textbook in the country on employment law is not because I care. We had a whole discussion about how I just don't take it in that way. It's because I know they don't think their textbooks are written by people who look like me. And I want them to see me so that they can look at me and say, oh my God, if she wrote a textbook, maybe I can too. Because the truth is you can do that. And with my business law textbook that I wrote, which is the last one I wrote, I told the publisher straight up, I'm not putting a textbook out that does not reflect the world. So don't bring me any cover stuff that has only white folks on it. That's not my world. That's not anybody's world. Okay, it's gotta, I believe in walking the walk and talking the talk. So on the front of that cover, one of the images is a white, a, a black male. I saw it and loved it. It's not like any other book out there, but I understood I have to walk the walk in addition to talking the talk. When I write textbooks, when I wrote the legal regulatory environment of business in a diverse society, I said, I'm writing this because the law doesn't happen in a vacuum. I can't just tell you the rules. Think about the rules about going down the street with your, your lamp on or not switching lanes. Okay, we all know you're not supposed to do that. But who gets picked up for it more? Yeah. My folk do. Absolutely. I need to have you know that because law is not created in a vacuum. It's not executed in a vacuum and it's not enacted in a vacuum. So there's, it's not interpreted in a vacuum by courts. It's interpreted by people who have these messages Yeah. and that's going to be reflected. So when you learn the law, you need to learn the stuff that surrounds the law so that you can see, yeah, this is the law, but look at how this works out. So we're talking about intellectual property. Yeah, there's these rules about it. But look what happened to the black folk who wrote songs, who had their music totally taken over by white folk. We just saw the picture Bozeman was in, selling, selling his stuff for $5 and then taking it and make millions of dollars off it. Happened all the time. You need to know that. And I'm not going to act like it doesn't exist. The same thing with the employment law textbook. I'm not just going to tell you Title VII says you're not supposed to discriminate against people on the basis of race, color, religion, gender, national origin. Nah, you need to know what it was like for black folk to try to vote. They got killed, they got thrown in prison. You need to know what it was like for them to have a job where somebody said, we're taking that job from you if you go to try to vote. They need to know that. If they don't know that, why would they think anything needs to be changed? And I want you to see the world as it is. And I take my responsibility as a Howard alum very seriously in terms of not just putting out some stuff that you can find goes with the norm, but instead tells you the truth. Who, who holds these? So these textbooks that we've been exposed to like for years and years um, growing up, growing up as kids, um, 
who is, is there like a body that holds that that facts checks these things or do they just free to just put whatever in the textbook it, it varies depending on what kind of book you write mine aren't fact checked you're a professional they're editors that's what they do the subject matter is what i do um but, but like a history read. book a history book in a school would you that know that sorry because when you're talking about primary or secondary books those are usually adopted at the state level by a state governing board but listen to this you were talking about trump this is crazy. Remember when that whole TikTok thing was going on? And mm -hmm. because TikTok is owned by the Chinese. China, yeah. Yeah. And and the president didn't like it. He said it presented a you know security risk and all of that. That made sense. But what he did was he he told the US, either y'all buy it or I'm shutting it down. Well, nobody wanted TikTok shut down. So folk stepped up to the plate and said, We'll buy it. Walmart was one of those people, and there was somebody else I can't think. It was like Walmart and like Cisco, some type of technology company. Yeah, it was a name I wasn't familiar with. But as part of that deal, think about this of what happened. As part of that deal, the president said, okay, I'll let you go ahead and buy it and save TikTok. But as part of the deal, you have to give me $500 million for us to be able to put into the curriculum, school curriculum, these books that have a traditional approach, a heritage approach language to the history of the country. And remember, he had already said you couldn't have diversity initiatives by the federal government or any federal contractor. And I've been, I've done work at the National Security Agency, the Federal Labor Relations Board. He said you couldn't, I mean, the uh, National Labor Relations Board, he said you can't have that diversity stuff anymore because that's un-American and you need to have a curriculum that reflects these traditional values. And I'm like, has he seen a textbook lately? That's exactly why this crap is out there because that's what people keep putting in those textbooks. Texas still fights not to have the Alamo really told the way it was, because of course the victor is the one that tells the story, right? Absolutely. One of the things that I think is extremely is important is that we keep a sense of history. I don't want to erase history, okay? But I don't believe that we have to laud it either. And when those stories that you're talking about being in those textbooks were written, they were written at another time when we didn't have the kind of sensibility that we do now, the kind of awareness that we do now, the kind of mindset that makes a corporation say, black lives really do matter and we're gonna put our money where our mouth is. That was a, this is a very different time. Why wouldn't the books reflect that? Just like, why wouldn't the name of your buildings reflect that? How do you say, think that uh, the history books are going to remember Donald Trump? There's only one way to remember him. I mean, remember him for what he did. Okay, that speaks for itself. We don't well, it's to it's a way to, so you know, it's a way to write about it. So you could say, like, I, I could write about Donald Trump and I could focus on the economy. You know what I mean? And then oh, yeah. to the person that's reading it, like, oh, man, this was a great time. You know, I could write about Donald Trump and talk about the pandemic. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if, like, you know, how are they going to remember him? You, you know? know, I am really a very avid amateur historian. I mean, I love looking back at history because it. I think the older you get, it's like a plane rising off the ground, you know, and, and when you're young, all you can see is what you're seeing around you as you're sitting on that plane. The older you get, the more you can see. Oh, that's a highway over there. And there's where my car is parked. And, you know, that, that's where those trees were that I passed by. The picture becomes much clearer because the dust clears. And I've lived through so much history until going back and looking at it now and thinking about it allows you to see it in ways you couldn't when it was just a story on the news. So think about the difference between today is a week ago that there, the seditionist overran the Capitol at Trump's very incitement, okay? And today he was, of course, um, impeached. When you saw that happen last Wednesday, a week ago today, they were just sort of going through what was happening, trying to, you know, sort of go to all of their people and say, what's going on where you are? Now that we are pulled back from it and we're a week later, 
and they could investigate it more, it was like, oh, okay. So the order was given by them to not send in as many people or these people did this in the, in, when they were in there. I thought it was just a few of them. Turns out it was thousands of them in there. Um, I didn't understand. I didn't realize I hadn't seen it yet, but they were actually peeing and pooping all over the place. They were ransacking people's offices. We know so much more now that gives her a, us a different look at the whole picture than if we had just left with the picture that we saw. That's one of the good things about having a bit of a distance between history. It doesn't change the facts. What it does is it usually gives you a better picture. What you said is absolutely accurate. I could look at my retirement, which is, of course, very important to me now that I've actually retired this month. I could look at that and say, what a great president. But that's not the whole story. Mm -hmm. And all I want historians to do is tell the whole story, not part of the story. And there are certain things, you know, I, I know where to go to put the whole story together. I know I can go to MSNBC for some stuff, but they're going to go real far left. Don't want to do that. I'm going to go to Health Post. I'm going to go to Washington Post. I'm going to go to New York Times. I'm going to go to Wall Street Journal. And I understand where they're all coming from. And because they all have different stories they tell, different emphases. But when I put the whole thing together, I have a much more accurate picture. That's why I don't like us to do stuff right in the midst of things, because we haven't gotten a whole picture yet. My thought is that Capitol Police off, or the, the captain of the uh, police at the Capitol, it was too early to let him go. I understand you feel like you need to let some heads roll, but that would him just deciding one day, I got all these people overrunning the Capitol. The epitome of anything that would have ever happened at the Capitol. I mean, he says, yeah, I think I'll just sit back and let that happen, see what's going to happen. Oh, hell no. Somebody was giving him some orders from somewhere saying yeah. stand down. Right. It just doesn't make any sense. His whole thing is security. Absolutely. And they're running this. Right, the, na the nation's capital, there. you know, because we know if that would have been another group of people, that would have never happened. Oh, police. You know that's right. <laughs> No way. Yeah. Think about, remember when those people were standing out on the state house stairs in Michigan, fully armed, fully, fully armed, armed. Yeah. AK-47s and crap. That's crazy. And when I just, saw that, I was like, because they didn't like COVID regulations for Pete's sake. I remember what though, when um, the Black Panthers, I don't remember, I wasn't alive, but I remember learning about the Black Panthers. I think they, when they were like in, getting into like learning their rights, and they found yep. out that they could carry like weapons and they yep. went to like the state capitol in California. Which was perfectly legal. Yeah. I remember perfectly them doing legal. that. And that was that was a powerful uh yeah. Thing. That was a really good example, actually, of what happens when the dust clears, because as it was going on, it was portrayed the way they were being treated was being portrayed as sort of, you know. You, you almost had to be a fringy not to believe the press that said they were doing something. And as it turns out, they weren't doing jack except for challenging the status quo. It was always about protecting their communities. That's all it was about. They mm -hmm. weren't looking for trouble. They wanted to feed their kids and give them breakfast. They wanted to be able to have their, their, their homes and selves protected. But that was a challenge to the status quo because of what people thought about black folk and rising up. And the people that were actually being able to capture people's attention about that, it was like, oh, no, you're going down the wrong road with that. Yeah, they made a law right after that. Ronald so Reagan. that's where COINTELPRO came from, counterintelligence program, to try to discredit them. And they ended up killing them. Yeah, I remember Ronald Reagan passed a law right after that, the Mofred Act, to eliminate uh, carrying those guns. So my, my last question, uh, what advice do you have for 18, 19 year old Don Bennett that's coming into Howard University right now and wants to get the best out of that Howard experience, but also wants to, you know, achieve their goals yeah, in life? Yeah. Enjoy where you are. I enjoyed partying when I was there. I was, you know, I was an honor student, but it was more because I didn't want to look like an idiot than it was because I wanted to be smart. Um, and I never know, you know, I was perfectly healthy, but like in law school, especially, what if I got sick and then, you know, I'd be hundreds of pages behind. So I always worked ahead. Um, I would say enjoy where you are, soak up the entire experience 
things will come as they will come to you. They will come. Don't be too anxious for it. It's not like you can skip over this part to get to that part. All of it goes to make you who you are. So party like it's 1999. <laughs> you know, be careful. Don't, you know, have stuff that's going to be left over from that party that you don't want. But enjoy the time. Soak it all in. Feel a sense of agency about the changes you can make and know how, especially if you're at Howard. Oh my God, y'all, does it get any better? No, it doesn't. I mean, the experience you have by being there, being around so many incredibly brilliant black folk, having the ambiance of being able to study in a place where you are truly seen and loved and valued for who you are. You need that for when you go out into the world and the world does not necessarily see you the same way. Difference between the segregated society and the non-segregated society. You need this as a buffer to prepare you and don't ever forget it. Because when in those dark days where you're gonna be feeling like, are you sure you're okay? You are okay. We know you are okay. We know you are prepared. We know you can do this. We see you. We know what you can accomplish and you absolutely can do it. You can do, look at, do, what's the name of the ticket? Biden-Harris? Yes, HBCU, Howard. That's what we're capable of. We could have told you that a long time ago. People were writing off HBCUs, excuse me? Look at her, look at Thurgood, look at all of the good that has come, come out of there. You know, Debbie Allen, I mean, the list goes on. And I guess I'm one of them too. Absolutely. So Miss Don Bennett Alexander, thank you. You've been a wonderful guest on the show today. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, we got a true historic, not a, we, we got a, a historical figure. We got someone that has been Ahead of, ahead of her time and now it's uh you know the rest of the world is getting caught up so i appreciate you taking the time out again and uh enjoy the rest of your night all right you too josh thank you again so much for doing this thank, thank you. you for giving back to howard this way for sure thank you for joining the hu movement a podcast where we highlight folks that have contributed to the howard legacy at the highest levels to hear more interviews or purchase merchandise please visit www.humovemakers.com.